kid time. Thank you, Bill and Kelly. Well, if you haven't been introduced to Brother Phil yet, Brother Phil is, uh, well, you're going to learn all about him, but uh, he has written uh, three books. He shared that with us in the uh, Sunday school time. The book that I got exposed to Brother Phil was uh, How to Reach My Prodigal. And not that I had a prodigal, but very similar to him, had bunches of families that, that wanted to know, what did I do wrong, what do I do now? And so that got us connected, and that's why he's here today. So I want you to give a warm Bethel welcome to Brother Phil Waldrop. Amen. Thank you, Brother Ben. I have looked so forward to being here. We've had such a good time as Brother Ben and I talked in preparation for this day. The only thing I need to tell you, your pastor made me a promise, and he is not keeping it. When he found out that I, uh, I understand that <coughs> you said this is Poduck. Poduck, yeah. There's a Poduck, Alabama, too. Did you? Yeah. Um, and I hailed from there. Uh, so I fully understand. I, I, you know, I don't want to out-country the preacher, but I grew so far out in the country that we had to go to Wardstown to go hunting. That's how far we were out in the country. So I had told him in our phone conversation that we were talking about eating country food, and I said, my favorite thing is fried green tomatoes. And he said, I promise you, if you'll come to our church, I will cook you some fried green tomatoes. Your pastor lied to me. He did not cook me any fried green tomatoes, which is good. Now I can get to come back maybe, make him fulfill that promise. But I have looked so forward to being here and just delighted uh, to be a part of it. And thank you so much for, for just being encouraging after Sunday school and so many of your comments and what you said. Well, what I want to share with you this morning, if you want to go ahead and open your Bible to the book of Romans chapter 16. Romans chapter 16, and this morning I want to talk to you about the principle that changes everything. I want to share with you this morning a principle that is so powerful, if you practice it as an individual, it will change how people relate to you. If you own a business and you practice this principle, it will have a positive impact on your business. And the context in which I'm going to share it this morning, if you practice this principle as a church, people will be driving from miles around to be a part of your church. Now, I realize I just said a very high standard for what I'm going to share. But I think by the conclusion of this message, you will agree with me that it is true and it is a principle that changes everything. But before I share with you the principle, let me just briefly tell you how I come to discover this principle. My grandmother, my father's mother, lived to be 96 years of age. She had a wonderful mind. She cared for herself. She lived alone. She taught a Sunday school class until she was 90 years old. And my grandmother was just one of those people who lived life to the fullest. She just enjoyed life. And she always said she wanted to live to be 102. So one day I thought, that's very unusual. So we all called her Big Mother. I said, Big Mother, why do you li want to live to be 102? She said, well, I'd like to live to be 100 so I can say I did it. And then I'd like to have two years to brag about it. So that was my grandmother. But as my grandmother got older, she developed this habit of saying things, and you knew what she meant, but it was not what she said. You ever been around somebody like that? They'll say something. You know what they meant, but it wasn't what they said. Now, I have a little book that I have written so many of these down, uh, but let me just share with you two or three of them because I want you to get the spirit of my grandmother. Uh, the church where she attended, she attended this little Baptist church near her home, and the preacher, he, he came down with a very serious illness which was going to affect his ability to speak and as such preach, and the church was really struggling. Why would this man have such a, a serious issue with, with, you know, and why would God allow that? So he called me and he said, Phil, would you come to our church, and I want you to talk to our congregation about suffering and how God uses suffering in our life. 
And so I agreed to do that. So I went to my grandmother's church and I preached on suffering and how God uses it in our life. And at the conclusion of the service, my grandmother walked up to me and very sincere looked me right in the eye and she said, son, I want you to know that I did not know what suffering was until I heard you preach this morning. <laughs> now, I know what she meant, but it wasn't what she said. I'll give you another one. Every time somebody heard me preach and called to report to my grandmother, my grandmother in turn called to report to me what they said. And one day she called me and she said, oh, I was talking to my friend Hazel, and she said you preached at her church Sunday. And I said, yes, ma'am, I, I did. And she said, well, let me tell you what she said about your preaching. I said, well, I'd like to know. She said for me to tell you that the last guest preacher they had preached for one hour and said absolutely nothing, but you did it in 30 minutes. <laughs> I know what she said, but I, I know what she meant. But anyway, that was my grandmother. I went to see my grandmother one day. I didn't share this early service. Y'all have to tell them about this. But I went to see my grandmother one day, and she lived in a little mobile home behind my aunt. And I could tell she was feeling blue. She just wasn't having a good day, and that was very unusual for my grandmother. And I said to her, I said, are you having a good day? She said, I'm having a terrible day. I said, are you not feeling good? No, I feel fine, but I'm having a terrible day. I said, well, why are you having a terrible day? She said, because I got up this morning and I got to thinking. Do you know all my brothers and sisters except one? She came from a large family. All my brothers and sisters are dead. She said, I want you to know I got to thinking yesterday. Every single person I went to school with is dead. Every one of them. She said, do you know everybody in our church is even close to my age is dead. And I said, well, big mother, that's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. You're still here. She said, oh, no, it's terrible. It's terrible. I said, well, how can that be terrible? My grandmother's name was Lenny. That's an important part of this story. I said, well, how can that be so terrible? She said, because they're all sitting in heaven right now looking at each other saying, I don't think Lenny's coming. I don't think Lenny's coming. <laughs> That was my grandmother, okay? So you get the spirit of my grandmother. But my grandmother also had this, when she got older, she got into a daily routine. And this was her routine. She would get up every morning, and she had four or five friends, older friends, that she called every morning, I guess to see if they got up. I don't know. But she would call those four or five friends. Then she would eat lunch. And after lunch, she called those same four or five friends then she'd eat what she called her supper, and then before she went to bed, she called those same four or five friends every day. Now, here's the problem. If my grandmother called you and you were not one of those four or five people, she had a tendency to start a conversation in the middle of a conversation. She just kind of assumed you know what you've been, their mother's been talking about all day. So one day, I'm sitting in Atlanta airport, about to get on a plane to go preach, and my cell phone rang, and it was my grandmother. Now, that was unusual. Most of the time, I called her. She rarely called me. So I saw it was her, and I thought, well, this is a pleasant surprise. And so I answered my phone, and I said, hello, big mother. And without, that's what we called her, without any words of introduction, without her saying, son, how are you? How's the family? Where are you going to preach? Without any words of introduction, I said, hello, big mother. And my grandmother rather desperately said, son, what's wrong with Obadiah? I'm like you. I had no idea what my grandmother was talking about. But I suddenly thought, well, you know, somebody in our family named Obadiah is sick, and she's trying to figure out what's wrong with him, thinking I know and I, don't, can't, I can't think of nobody in our family named Obi, Obi Dai. I couldn't think of one person. So I thought, I'm about to show my ignorance of my family. And so I decided very quickly that I would deflect her question by asking her a question. So when she said again, son, what's wrong with Obadiah? I said, well, big mother, is he sick? And she said, no, he's dead. And I said, that's probably what's wrong with him. She said, son, he's been dead for years. 
And I said, okay, big mother, we've got to start this conversation over because you've asked me what's wrong with Obadiah. Now you tell me he's been dead for years. Then my grandmother explained her question. My grandmother had a Bible that she got during World War II when Franklin Delano Roosevelt was president. Now, I don't know what that had to do with her Bible, but if you ever draw attention to her Bible, she would tell you she got it in World War II when Franklin Delano Roosevelt was president. And my grandmother had done something that some people like to do, especially of uh, older generation. My grandmother, she ever since she got that Bible during World War II, when you know who was president, ever since then, my grandmother, every time she heard a preacher preach, she would write their name in the margin of the Bible, she'd put a date, and she'd draw a little line over to that verse. She did that every time she heard a preacher preach. And my grandmother, now part of the reason she did that was she wanted you to be impressed with her memory. See, a preacher would preach, she'd walk up and she'd say something like, you know, Brother Ben, I remember, I've heard that sermon before. I remember, I believe it was 1978, July the 5th. No, big mother, you don't remember it. It's right there in your Bible. Got it written down. Well, my grandmother, every morning before she called all those friends, she would get up. She had a little devotional book that had suggested scripture. She would read the scripture and then she'd read the devotion, have a little time of prayer before she called her friends. Well, that morning she had gotten up and the suggested scripture in the little devotion book was from the Old Testament book of Obadiah. And when she finished reading, she looked down at her Bible that she had since World War II when Franklin Delano Roosevelt was president. And she looked down and realized she had no, nothing written in the margins and suddenly realized that since World War II, going to church three times a week, she had never heard one sermon from the book of Obadiah. And she started wondering why. So she decided to call her preacher grandson and ask him, Son, what's wrong with Obadiah? So that was the reason for her question. Well, I went to see my grandmother after that, and I said, Well, let me see your Bible. And I picked up my grandmother's Bible, and there were several verses like John 3.16 where she had heard so many sermons she couldn't get them all written in the margin. And then as I looked, I realized that there were books of the Bible like Obadiah and Nahum in the Old Testament where my grandmother had never heard a sermon, not one. And there were large sections of books of the Bible like Leviticus and Ezekiel and Job where my grandmother had never heard a sermon. And would you believe there were chapters in the Bible where my grandmother had never heard a sermon? And one of those chapters was Romans chapter 16. And so what I decided was I was going to go back and revisit those chapters and verses to see if there's something we as preachers have missed. And when I went to Romans 16 and I began to read, it was then that I discovered the principle that changes everything. Now, the reason why most preachers have never really preached from Romans 16 is because all Paul does in this chapter is send greetings to friends. Say hello to this person, greet that person, or if we put that in a good way of Missouri terminology, say howdy to that person for me. That's all Paul does. But in the midst of that, there is the principle that changes everything. Now, to give us a biblical basis, look at these verses with me from Romans 16. Look at verse 3. Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my helpers in Christ Jesus, who have for my life laid down their own necks, unto whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. Verse 6. Greet Mary, who bestowed much labor on us, Salute Andronicus and Juna, my kinsmen and my fellow prisoners, who are of note among the apostles, who also were in Christ before me. Greet Amplius, my beloved in the Lord. Then notice verse 12. Here are two of my favorite people in the New Testament. They're only mentioned here, and I just like them because I like their names. It says, Salute Trifina and Trifosa, who labor in the Lord. Do you know those were probably twin sisters? And verse 13, he said, salute Rufus, chosen in the Lord, and his mother and mine. Now, let me ask you a question this morning. Do you believe the early Christians loved the Apostle Paul? Well, of course you do. 
You cannot read the New Testament without seeing how people loved Paul. Do you remember when Paul was on his final missionary journey and the book of Acts records how he went to Ephesus and the day came for him to leave. The Bible says the elders of the church went with him down to the ship and before he got on the ship to leave, they had prayer together and after they prayed, Paul told them that they would never see his face again this side of heaven and they fell on his neck and wept. Now, you know the reason why people weep when you leave? is because they love you. People loved Paul. But do you know why people loved Paul? It's because Paul loved people. Now, here's the principle that I discovered. You ready? People love people that love people. Would you say that out loud with me? People love people that love people. Now, if I went around the room and I said, do you love people? Everybody in this room would say yes. Nobody would stand up and say, no, I'd like to testify I hate everybody. If you did, you wouldn't be here. Okay? We all want to think we love people. If I ask you, are you a church that loves people? You would say, absolutely. We're a church that loves people. So our problem is not do we want to love people or do we love people. Here's our problem. How do we make people feel loved? How do people know we love them? And in Romans chapter 16, Paul demonstrates three things he did that made people feel loved. Here's the first one. Paul understood that love appreciates people. You see, when Paul wrote Romans 16, the first time I sat and I read it, and I saw all of these names, I remembered that when Paul wrote the book of Romans, he had not been to Rome. Now, we know from the book of Acts that he goes later in his life to Rome, and we know from history that he probably died in Rome. But when Paul was writing Romans, he had never been to Rome, but he knew, we know from the early part of Romans, that he prayed and he would go. He knew in his heart he was going to go someday. So I thought, I know what Paul is doing. I bet if I researched these people, I would find all the people he mentions are wealthy people and civic leaders and influential people. So when he gets there, you know, they've kind of, by saying hello to him, it's kind of, kind of, you know, grease the skids for his arrival. So he would be ready, and these people could help him when he got there. So to my surprise, when I went through this list, I discovered that of the 27 people Paul mentions, half are slaves or women. Do you know in Roman culture that a woman or a slave had no standing at all in society. The best way I could describe it in our American culture is a woman or a slave was viewed as a possession, much like we would view a dog or a cat. They had no legal standing. Or let me put that another way. The people, half of the people Paul mentioned are people who can do nothing for him or to him. You know, the real test of love is, do you love people and appreciate people who can do nothing for you or to you? One of the people who has made a profound impact for the gospel, not only in America, but around the world, is a man who died just a few years ago at 99 years of age named Billy Graham. Now, most of us in this room grew up hearing Billy Graham on television. Younger people are not as familiar with him. But Billy Graham was an evangelist who traveled the United States and the world. And when I tell you he drew large crowds, he packed all of the major stadiums in America for night after night. He spoke one time in Seoul, Korea to over one million people who came to hear him preach. And not only that, he was one of the most influential world leaders uh, in modern history. Billy Graham was invited to Russia to preach when no Christians were. He was invited to North Korea to come when the grandfather of the current dictator was alive, the first American that had ever been invited to come and meet with him. And Billy Graham went and met with him. So the question becomes, 
Why? Why did this man have such influence, a man of impeccable character? Well, one of his workers who worked with him all of his life, uh, at least in his public ministry, was a man named Maurice Scobie. And Maurice Scobie and I were eating lunch one day, and I was talking to him about Billy Graham, and I said, here is a man who really does not have an ego at all, one of the most influential people in the world. And I said, I want you to tell me, is there any characteristic of Billy Graham that sets him apart? I know he's a good man, godly man, man of integrity, but is there anything that sets him apart? And without hesitation, Maurice Scobie said, absolutely, and I'll tell you what it is. The man truly appreciates everybody. He said, do you know when we traveled, you can't get him to a seat on an airplane because he's got to thank the flight attendants and, and the pilots. And when you go to a hotel, you can't get him to his room because he has to thank the maids and the people at the front desk. Do you know that when we would go to the stadiums, you couldn't get him to the platform because he had to stop and thank every usher and every first responder that was there? And not, even if he didn't know who he was, he didn't care. He truly appreciated him. That's why if you go to the Billy Graham Library today in Charlotte, North Carolina, and you go there, you will discover that of all the letters Billy Graham wrote in his lifetime, over 75% was to tell somebody, thank you. Now, let me ask you, do you think the reason why this man had such impact around the world and were world leaders, could it be that they saw something in him they did not see in others, that he wasn't concerned about what people could do for him or to him, but instead he appreciated people for who they are? Do you realize so often, if we're honest as a church, we say we love everybody, but let's be honest. If one Sunday morning you look up and a car pulls up and that car is just, I mean, it's just coming into the parking lot on faith and fumes and it's a miracle it even got here. And a family gets out and you look at them and you think, boy, that's poverty in the first degree. And you see, I mean, they're dirty and their clothes are dirty. You know, what do you think? Let's just be honest, just us girls, if y'all go tell it, we'll know who told it. But just between us, you're thinking, oh, they just won't help. They just want somebody to help with the power bill. And while you're looking at that family, you look over and another car pulls up and you find yourself thinking, I've always heard of a Bentley, but I've never seen one. And somebody pulls up and you realize it's one of the wealthiest persons in all the state of Missouri and, and they're going to possibly come to your church. Now let's be honest, how do we react to those two people? You look at the rich guy and you go, oh, praise God, he never pay stuff off and paved the parking lot. We do all this wonderful things. We need him in church. You say... And that's not how people react. Oh, yeah, they did. They did in Jesus' day. Go read the book of James because James said that's the problem you got is you say you love people, but we make a difference. Let me tell you something. You hear me carefully. The church that begins to love people for who they are and not what they can do for them will discover what I've discovered. And I've been in a lot of churches. I've been in big churches and, and small churches. I've been in churches that they don't have room to get the people in. And I've been in churches that put for a miracle they're not going to be here in six months. I mean, I've been in all those churches. And one characteristic I've discovered is this. Every growing church I've ever been to loves people for who they are not for what they can do for them. And let me tell you something. Here's a little secret. If you as a church will love the people nobody wants, God will give you the people everybody wants. You know why? Because I've discovered something. Rich people want to be loved too. And if they think you just like them or love them for what they have, they know that's not love because love is not based on what you have or what you do. Love appreciates people for who they are. But let me tell you a second thing Paul knew. Paul knew that love acknowledges people. Did you know if I had been writing Romans 16, here's how I'd read. One verse. Tell all my friends hello, period. I wouldn't have listed all these people. And I would have been writing with a modern computer. Paul is writing with a primitive writing instrument. Probably one that has been discarded because he's in prison. I mean, it's almost like trying to write something with an ink pen, and it wasn't that easy, but writing with an ink pen when it's out of ink, and you got to find another one. One archaeologist said it may have taken Paul as long as one minute to write one letter of the Greek alphabet. Think about that the next time you read the New Testament. And if that's true, it took him in the Greek nearly 30 minutes to write Tryphena and Tryphosa's name. But you know why Paul did it? Because Paul knew love always acknowledges people. Let me give you an example of that. You ever had a friend who maybe came to Bethel and 
<clears throat> through job or other circumstances, they had to move away, couldn't come to church here. And so they're out looking for a home church, and you're talking to them on the phone. And you say, have you found a new church home like Bethel? And they say, oh, we've been looking. They start telling you all the churches they visit. We went to this church and this church and this church. And then finally they'll say, and we went to this church, but we're not going back there. We didn't like that church. So you ask them, what was it you didn't like? Here's the number one thing they'll say. We went to that church and nobody spoke to us. Now, why does that offend people? I mean, think about it. In your whole life, you've never heard anybody say, yeah, I got thrown in jail last night, but I'm not going back because nobody spoke to me. You never heard that. I went to the ER, but I, I had an emergency, having that heart attack. But I'm telling you, I'm not going to the ER no more because nobody spoke to me. But when people come to church, it offends them if we don't speak to them. Why? I'll tell you. Because subconsciously, we all know something. That if you're important to me, I'll speak to you. And if I look at you and ignore you, what my body language has said is, you're, no, you're nothing to me. Now, that's exactly the way people process it. So Paul said, if you love people, you'll acknowledge people. And do you know the Bible tells us two ways we're to do that? Now, one is what Paul practiced here. 3 John verse 14 says we're to call the brethren by name. We're to call each other's name. You know, we would all say Jesus is the sweetest name we know, but the second sweetest name you know is your name. If you don't believe it, just, just notice how people react when they hear it called over a PA system. Boy, they just perk up. It's something about hearing their name. Even a small child, like before, there's something when you call their name. They'll turn their head and look at you. People like to hear their name because the name is the totality of who they are. And if you ever talk to people, I have friends who have run for office at the, particularly at the federal level, where they're running for a federal office, and they train them. And you know one of the things they train them is when you meet somebody, call their name three times. Ben, it's good to see you. Ben, great to be with you. God bless you, Ben. If you call people's name three times, the statistics show they're more likely to vote for you. Now, if it's true that you ought to call people's names, if you're politicking or if you're doing anything else, how much more important is it that when people come to church, we call them by name? But I said there's two ways. You know what the other one is? It's right here in verse 16 in Romans 16. You read it for yourself. Paul said, salute each other with a holy kiss. Now, I didn't write it. It's right there. Of course, this is pre-COVID, you understand. I, I get that. But you say, you're you telling us that we ought to kiss everybody that comes? No, that's the way the Romans did it. In our culture, it's the equivalent of hugging a neck or shaking a hand. And we're getting over the COVID thing. Hopefully, that's going to be behind us. And when we do, you, when you see somebody, you go like, hey, hey, Ben, man, good to see you. And you hug their neck. How does that person feel? They feel loved because we took time to acknowledge them. Can I give you a secular illustration of that? Years ago, you need to read the, the autobiography of Sam Walton. Sam Walton was the founder of Walmart. And Sam Walton, who had been in business prior to starting Walmart, realized when he began, he could not compete on volume. So the price is that he could sell to people, other people could sell it cheaper. But he got the business. Here's why. Some of you are old enough to remember this. Because at every Walmart store, when you walked in, there was a Walmart greeter. As long as Sam Walton was living, he made sure at the door of every Walmart was someone whose total job was to, hey there, young lady, hey, young man, good to see you, good to see you folks, thanks for stopping at Walmart. And he discovered that that experience alone caused people to come <laughs> to Walmart. Now think about that. If it's valid for them, it's valid for us to acknowledge people because love always acknowledges people. Let me give you a third thing. Love always affirms people. You know, Paul didn't just say, greet Priscilla, Aquila, Juno. No, no, he bragged on them. Paul said, hey, say hello to Priscilla and Aquila. And you folks don't know this, but they once risked their life for me. Well, Priscilla and Aquila knew that. Paul's just bragging on them to the church. And say hello to Juno and Andronicus. They came to Jesus before I did. And why the apostles sat around and talk about what great Christians they are. 
and say hello to Mary. Well, that woman's done so much for the Lord. And Tryphena and Tryphosa, what an encouragement. He said, hey, by the way, say hello to Rufus and his mama. She's been like my own mama. That's literally what he said. You know what Paul's doing? He's bragging on those people. You want people to feel loved? You start bragging on people. Mark Twain had a slogan, he's right. He said, people can live on a good compliment for six months. He's right. Because we live in a society. Now, I don't mean you're, you're saying things that aren't true, but you're saying things that are true, and you're building people up. You're firm, and you brag on people when they're not around. That has three times the effect. I mean, if somebody says, well, you know, the preacher the other day was talking about you. What did he say about me? He said, you was probably the best teacher at our church. I heard somebody say that, they, when you sang, it just, it just made their day to hear you sing. When they saw you, your, your smile just causes them to just have a great day just seeing you. Boy, when people say stuff like that, man, you, you hold your head a little higher because it lets us know we're loved. It's affirming people. It's bragging on people. Let me tell you a little secret. When you really love people, you discover that love becomes a filter through which you see people. Let me illustrate. My wife and I, we have five grandkids, five grandkids. There's a reason why you have grandkids when, I mean, you have your kids when you're young because you get older, five grandkids. Whew, they wear you out. We love to see them come and we love to see them go. I mean, because they got a lot of energy. Uh, and some of you may know, I said this in Sunday school, I think, but it's true. You know, if you have children, you have hard days, just hang on one day. You'll have grandchildren. You'll understand grandchildren is God's reward for not killing your kids. That's really what it is. But you love grandkids. Well, let me tell you a little secret. Our two oldest, two granddaughters, are 10 years old, and one of them loves to play soccer, which is still a game I'm trying to understand. And the other one, she doesn't like sports. She likes dance. So can I tell you, I go to the soccer games. Can I just tell you what I tell people after that? Well, I'm not saying it because she's my granddaughter, but she's the best one on the team. <laughs> or I go to a dance recital. I tell people, you know, I'm not saying this because she's my granddaughter, but it's obvious she's the best one up there. <laughs> now, I want to tell you, one day I got thinking about that, and I thought, you know, I'm lying to people. I am saying that because they're my grandkids, so I just dropped that part. Now I just say to people, you obviously, she's the best one on the team. Yeah, she's the best dancer up there. Now, here's the funny part. I'm totally convinced of that. But you know why? Because I'm watching them play soccer through a filter called love. And I only see the goal, goals she scores. I don't see the mistakes she made. I see only the dance that was perfect, not the one where she failed. Let me tell you something. When you love people and you look at people through a filter of love, you don't see their faults. You see their good first. And you celebrate those good things and you brag on them about it. And when you do, people feel love. Let me give you an illustration. A true story of a five-year-old boy who understood this principle, practiced it, and I want you to see the result. His dad is a pastor, a dear friend, and from the time this little boy was four years of age, he became fascinated with the garbage truck. His dad said, I don't know why, but he loved to see the garbage man get the garbage. So six days a week, can't get him out of bed. But Wednesday morning, the garbage man ran early, about 7 o'clock. He was always up early, ate his cereal, and would stand on the front porch and awe oh, as he got the garbage. Somebody told him that the garbage man's name was Bill. So he got to his way, hey, Mr. Bill, hey, Mr. Bill. And he'd just stand there and watch him get the garbage. Well, Christmas came, the year he was five years old. Christmas came, and they were making their list of all the things they needed to, you know, gifts they needed to buy for Christmas. And as they were doing it, the little boy said, Mama, we need to get the garbage man a present. And his mama said, well, we don't normally get the garbage man a present. Well, I like him. We need to get him a present. Well, the father, seeing a kind of a teachable moment, he said, well, I'll tell you what. Why don't you and Mom bake some cookies, and we'll give that to Mr. Bill for Christmas. Oh, he thought that was a great idea. So that Tuesday night, we was to run on Wednesday morning. They made the cookies, and the next morning, he was up bright and early ready, and his dad said, now, you can't go to the street, but when you see him coming, you let me know. We'll take him the cookies. And a few minutes, he started yelling, he coming, Daddy, he coming. All right, get the cookies. So he got the paper plate cookies, a little paper towel on top, and my pastor friend and his five-year-old son walk down to the street. And the garbage man stops, and the garbage man gets out, and when he does, he... He says, uh, something wrong, sir? He said, oh, no, no, nothing's wrong. He said, 
probably noticed my son's rather fascinated. Oh, he is. He's always standing there waving at me. He said, well, our family wanted to get your family something for Christmas, and he and his mom make some cookies, and we want to give you those cookies. And the little boy hands it to him and says, Merry Christmas, Mr. Bill. And then my preacher friend said, I don't know where this comes from. He said, thank you for getting our garbage. It sure would stink around here if you didn't. <laughs> he took the cookies and he put them in the truck. And when he turned around, there was a little tear trickling down of his eye. And he said, you know, I don't think anybody's ever gave me a gift because I'm their garbage man. He said, but I thank you. And sir, what's your line of work? What do you do? Well, I'm the pastor of a Baptist church down the road. Well, uh, do you and your wife, maybe your family attend church? Well, it's just me and the wife, and I'm sorry to say we don't go to church, but we're we thinking about it. We, we might come to your church one Sunday. The little five-year-old said, hey, this Sunday, my preschool choir is going to sing before church some Christmas carols, and if you'll come listen to me sing, I'll sit with you during church. He said, we might do that. And sure enough, as the little choir came out to sing, the garbage man and his wife came in and sat down. And when he got through singing, that little boy went and sat with him just like he promised. But when church was over with, several people have told me this story. The little five-year-old had the garbage man and his wife introducing him to everybody saying, this is Mr. Bill, best garbage man in town, right there, right there. <laughs> Never spills any garbage. Best garbage man in town, right there. What do I need to tell you who came back to church the next Sunday? The garbage man and his wife. And the next Sunday, and it was in January, they called my pastor friend and said, can you come by our house? We need to talk to you. And when they did, they said, you know, we went to church when we were, early, were younger, earlier in our life, but we never really met Christ. And my pastor friend led the garbage man and his wife to the Lord. Let me ask you something. Do you, you see what happened? A five-year-old got the principle. He took time to appreciate somebody most people take for granted. He just took time to acknowledge, hey, Mr. Bill. And he took time to affirm, best garbage man in town right there. And that five-year-old who got this principle led the garbage man and his wife to the foot of the cross. It is a simple principle, but it is a principle that changes everything. People love people that love people. Would you say that with me one more time? People love people that love people. Let's bow our heads. Our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. Our musicians are coming, and in just a moment, we're going to stand and sing an old invitational hymn, a little modern spin on it. But it's a song you know called Just As I Am. But before we stand and before we sing, I want you to think about what I've shared this morning. Because, you know, it's my experience, as I said at the beginning, that people want to love people. They just don't know how to cause people to feel loved. And here's what I want to ask you. Would you be willing this morning would you be willing to say today, I want to be a person who loves people like Paul loves people? I realize this is the anniversary of your church. But can I tell you that the next 123 years if the Lord doesn't return can be the greatest years in the life of this church if you just practice the simple principle of appreciating people, acknowledging, affirming. So here's what I'm going to ask you to do. In a moment, I'm going to have a prayer. And when I finish that prayer, we're going to stand. And our music team will begin leading us in singing. You just know from memory, you can hymn along. Maybe it's been a long time since you walked down an aisle. But today's a day I think you need to do it. Because I'm going to ask you if you'd be willing to come. Brother Ben's going to be at the front. And to come and say, Brother Ben, today I am making a commitment to love people like Paul loved people. Now, for some of you, that may get you out of your comfort zone. You may have to find yourself when visitors come or other around other people to, to go to them and to meet them and to greet them and to learn their name and to share. Or maybe it's while you're this week and you go into a convenience store and you can just tell the young girl behind the desk is having a hard time and maybe just find a way 
to brag on her and to affirm her. To learn her name, to let her know you care about her. Every day there are people who cross our path who just want to be loved. And I'm asking you, would you make that commitment? If so, when we start to sing in a moment, I don't want you to wait one moment, but I want you to come and say, Brother Ben, today I'm making that commitment. You can go back to your seat. Because see, when you make it publicly, you're committing yourself, and you're committing yourself to the Lord to do it. Now, you may be here today, and you're not a Christian. You're certainly welcome to come. Listen, Brother Ben, I stop everything else to share with you how Jesus can come into your heart and how you can become a Christian today. Some of you may have come today to make another decision. You're welcome to make it as well. But I'm going to ask those of you who are Christian that you will lead the way and without a moment's hesitation to step out and come to say, Brother Ben, today I'm coming to say I want to love people like Paul loved people and I want our church to be a church that loves people like Paul loved people. Father, speak to hearts, give people the freedom to respond and I thank you as people are coming now in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. We stand, we're singing. You come on right now and do it, won't you?